Hello, class. So last time I talked about one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman. Today I'm going to talk to about a different author, most of whose works I've read, who also features uh, witchcraft commonly in his stories. And this person has actually also cooperated with Neil Gaiman on one novel. So turning to my PowerPoint, So today I'm going to talk about witchcraft in the works of Terry Pratchett. And there's my qualifications and my email. So Terry Pratchett, who the heck is he? As I've mentioned before, I think if we in academia are going to talk about popular culture, we have to at least set forth some rationale for why a given example of pop culture is worth engaging with. So who the heck is Terry Pratchett? Well, for one thing, he's this guy. Maybe you've seen uh, seen him if you go to um, science fiction or fantasy cons. Uh, his books are very popular. Um, he was a English novelist. I don't think he's no longer with us. I've yet to read the last one or two novels he wrote because I'm not looking forward to not having any new Pratchett to read. So he lived from 1948 to 2015. And he was won all kinds of awards. Um, list that I have here, and is a limited one, has about 17 different awards. Things like the Carnegie Medal, Prometheus Award, uh, let's see, um, Edward, oh, Los Angeles Times Book Prize, Free and Adult Literature, Boston Globe. I could go on and on, but then I'd be pu pushing past the time limit. His books were so incredibly popular, not only with uh, general audiences, but with people who were um, sophisticated, that he ended up being knighted for his services to the English literature. And his primary inspiration, or the source of a lot of his books, was fairy tales, in, um, but also English literature. He loved sorted and sorcery. And his most famous series, Discworld, started off as a satire of sword and sorcery and Lord of Rings. But as I read his books, I notice three discernible phases in the um, series that he wrote on a fictional disc-shaped planet called Discworld. So, the earliest ones were kind of over the top of uh, forces that were satires of social, sword and sorcery and Lord of the Rings. And in these forces, the characters were typically rather two dimensional and the focus was on the pace and the humor. So, but then in the middle phase, he starts writing, he started writing novels that were set uh, outside the main timeline and locations of the earlier novels. So I see this as his world building for phase. So you start having novels that are self-contained and you have a little bit more characterization. But then finally, uh, the last third of the novels strike me as being satires of contemporary culture. By this time he had created a uh, engaging um, fantasy world that was so complete that he could use this fantasy world as a way of satirizing um, kind of popular genres or phenomena or um, practices in the United States. So one of his running characters, for example, was Samuel Vines, who was a detective in the Night Watch in this incredibly uh, corrupt city. And Vimes, in the course of the novels, is obviously meant to be a satire of police procedurals or private eye stories. And in these later novels, the characterization becomes more nuanced. You even start having um, characters with inner life and you have noticeable character development. So now he had a whole sequence of novels that involved three witches living in a remote location in his fantasy world, the witches of Lankra. And they hit on a number of different standard tropes. So for example, we have Granny Weatherwax. 
There is one artist rendering of her. And she is an intimidating character who is part of a clan of three women, mother, maid, and crone. Uh, she, you can guess which one she is. And perhaps we have a little bit of the Roman notion of a witch as a uh, hag. Uh, she's portrayed, though, as working primarily as a village wise woman. But then she, she has a contemporary, Nanny Og. Now, Nanny Og is portrayed as being much more friendly, much sweeter, mother, much more motherly. She is a figure of um, fertility with many children. And she is more welcoming than Granny Weatherwax. Well, Nanny Og also taps into the notion of she who is three, the tripartite goddess of Wicca. But we also find that she is definitely understood to be a wise woman who makes her living helping people with the problems in their, in their lives. So Granny Weatherwax, for example, is the one that you hit if you need assistance preparing um, the body of a beloved one for funeral. Whereas Nanny Og is the one that you go to if you need a midwife. And then we have two different characters, but I think they fulfill a common role and have certain mo motifs in common. Margaret Gar Garlic <clears throat> is portrayed as sort of a new agey type witch who loves jewelry and herbs and thinks that the more fancy occult jewelry she has, the more powerful she is. And she eventually uh, in the novel sequence gets married, though therefore she can no longer be the maiden. She is supplanted by Agnes Nitt. And Agnes Nitt is portrayed as being a bit more on the goth side of the spectrum. So both together, Margaret Garlic and Agnes Nitt um, represent Again, she who is three, this, this time the maiden, they are also wise women, but also they are wonderful parodies or satires of either uh, new agey type uh, Wiccans or uh, people who are into goth who also do uh, magic and witchcraft. Finally, and my favorite, Tiffany Aiken. Now, uh, in most of Pratchett's novels, uh, if a character recurs several times, you eventually get more and more revealed about them. But Tiffany Aiken is the one character who noticeably grows. She features in a series of five novels, and I think together they constitute what uh, the Germans call Bill Doug's Roman, a novel about the moral development of a young person. So in the first novel, she is nine, and then every other novel picks up with her two or three years later. And in the last novel, she is about 19 and finding her destiny and honing her skills and learning her lessons uh, to become a witch. Well, she uh, succeeds both Margaret Garlic and Agnes Nitt as the... Uh, three um, third member of this coven, but also she is definitely a wise woman. The witches in Lovecraft are more likely to do resolve problems by thinking ahead of people than doing actual magic, although they can if they have to. So now there's lots of other witches in Lovecraft's novels, but I think these are the ones that are given the most devotion. So what can we say then about the nature of witchcraft in Love, Lovecraft's novels? Well, first, the Greek witch trope is the only one that is not represented. I do see in a few of the novels you have antagonists to the three witches who either fulfill or subvert the Greek notion of a witch as glamorous and comely but dangerous. Um, he plays with both classical literary, but also folktale and, uh, and contemporary witchcraft themes. But when he does so, he usually does so satirically. Uh, early books fall into, I hate to say, gender essentialism. Originally, 
uh, only men can be sorcerers and women, and only women can be witches. It's understood that men uh, have a different kind of, of magic that they can wield that is very different from that, from that of women, although it's eventually developed that the witches are actually more powerful than the average sorcerer. Well, but he eventually comes along. In one of his novels titled Equal Rights, which is again satirical, but he's making fun of the reactions of bigoted older men to women entering male professions. Well, lo and behold, a woman is accidentally uh, initiated as a sorcerer. And that upsets the college of sorcerers in the main village uh, in these fantasy novels. Also, the last of the Tiffany Aiken novels, uh, The Shepherd's Crown, introduces a male witch. I, yes, he started off as a bit of a gender essentialist, but as time went on, I think he developed. So that's what I have to say about, share with you about the motif of witchcraft in the works of Terry Pratchett. These are my sources. The, the um, novels are great fun. They're good storytelling, but it's not just humor. It's not just fantasy. It's not just adventure. He's often making fun, satirizing our contemporary world by the way that he describes things happening in his, his fictional world where fantasy, uh, I'm sorry, magic fulfills much of the role that technology fulfills in our culture. So that's what I got to say. I will upload this to YouTube. Please make comments. Let me know what you think. Ciao for now.